Black people are in a state of an emergency. First of all, if you're going to talk about a revolutionary situation, you have to have people who are physically able to wage revolution, who are physically able to organize and physically able to do all that is done. People realize that this attack that we're under, I heard someone saying on TV today that it feels like every black person in America is being hunted. Women were definitely behind her. So she could take the lead and the men saw the strength in her and followed her. Yeah, but the question is, how do you get there? You get there by confrontation, violence. Oh, is that the question you were asking? Yeah. Because it's natural, because uh, the reason for it, you might say, is like a new awareness among black people that their own natural appearance, physical appearance, is beautiful and it's pleasing to them. For so many, many years, we were told that only white people were beautiful. Only straight hair, light eyes, light skin was beautiful. And so black women would try everything they could, straighten their hair, lighten their skin, to look as much like white women. But this has changed because black people are aware. And white people are aware of it too because white people now want uh, natural wigs. They want wigs like this. Dig it? Isn't it beautiful? All right. <laughs> We live in a land of milk and honey, but not everyone has a chance to devour it. See, that's, I mean, that's another thing. When you talk about a revolution, most people think violence, um, without realizing that the real content of any kind of revolutionary thrust lies in the, in, in the principles and the goals that you're striving for, not in the way you reach them. So that within SNCC, you had these women who were leaders in their own right before they ever got into SNCC. So you had these women who were just amazingly strong. Um, what, what's happened to the women in the civil rights, or women, period, how they get erased from? Often we're fighting for a place, but the women themselves were so busy, I say, doing the work that they did not necessarily seek the recognition. And I had heard about all the discriminations and all the things that were happening to us in Birmingham. So. I saw an opportunity that I needed to participate in the uh, demonstrations. And you were used by the system to harm your own mom, your own black mom. We have no respect for you. On the other hand, uh, because of the way this society is organized, because of the violence that exists on the surface everywhere, you have to expect that there are going to be such explosions. You have to expect things like that as reactions. Sound of the African drum, vibrating across the continent. Sounds of the African drum, from Cape to Cairo through the African diaspora. Sounds of the African drum, heard in every mountain and valley, reminding us of African warriors, reminding us of warrior queens, Amina and Ya Asantewa. Sounds of the African drum, Reminding us of Ethiopia's Queen Regant, the Candaces and Makeda. Sounds of the African drum, reminding us of Queens Mother Nande, Nefertiti, and Nzinga, reminding us of Queen Morimi. Sounds of the African drum, reminding us to remember our roots, reminding us not to forget our cultures, reminding us to hold on to our heritage, reminding us of our unique diversity. Sounds of the African drum, reminding us our strength lies in unity, reminding us of our proud history, reminding us to remember.
everybody. Welcome to the Shrine of the Black Madonna's Bila Kuda Experience. My name is Sister Camila Cotton, and I am excited to be able to share this new time with all of you. God is doing a new thing with our online ministry, with you and with me too. If you would go to your chat and rep your city, tell us where you're from, and please share this link with your family and friends so that they may join in on this virtual experience as well. Also, don't forget to like and comment your views. To learn more about whom we are, what we offer, and where you can join or serve, please go to www.shrineonline.org. Remember, God is doing a new thing within all of us so that we can change the Pan-African world community. I am an expression of God. I am one aspect of the grand divinity. I am cosmic energy. I am creative intelligence. I am one with God entirely, the creator of the entire universe. I am in God, and God is in me. I am the power of God unto salvation. I am the good shepherd, the divine light, and the abundant life. I am the essence of divine love, forgiveness, and sacrifice. I am the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Forever and ever, I shave and I am. I believe that human society stands under the judgment of one God revealed to all and known by many names. God's creative power is visible in the mysteries of the universe and the revolutionary Holy Spirit, which will not long permit men to endure injustice nor to wear the shackles of bondage in the rage of the powerless when they struggle to be free. And in the violence and conflict, which even now threaten to level the hills and the mountains. I believe that Jesus the Black Messiah was a revolutionary leader sent by God to rebuild the Black Nation Israel to liberate African people from powerlessness and from the oppression, brutality, and exploitation of the white Gentile world. I believe, I believe, I believe that the revolutionary spirit of God embodied in the Black Messiah is born anew in each generation and that black Christian nationalists constitute the living remnant of God's chosen people. In this day, and are charged by God with responsibility for the liberation of African people. I believe, I believe, I believe that both my survival and my salvation depend upon my willingness to reject individualism. And so I commit my life to the liberation struggle of African people and accept the values, ethics, morals, and program of the Black Nation defined by that struggle and taught by the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church. I don't know about tomorrow I just
The year was 1953, a time when black soldiers returning from the Korean War found the same social economic ills and racist violence that they faced before. Despite 600,000 African American men serving in all branches of the military service alongside their white counterparts, they still struggled. Unsuccessful in securing well-paying jobs, soldiers encountered segregation and endured targeted brutality, especially while wearing their military uniforms. Walter Childs, an accomplished musical artist, enrolled in Berkeley School of Music in Boston, where his classmates included a young Quincy Jones. Walter met the love of his life, Helen Kendall, a nursing student from Thompsonton, Georgia. Within three years, they were married, and their fruitful bond created three children who are accomplished in their own right. Beyond Walter's musical artistry and Helen's aptitude for nursing, they were entrepreneurs of several ventures. One being the Magic LTD, a record and bookstore that became a gathering place for young black activists. Inspired by the call to embrace black Christian nationalism by the Honorable Reverend Albert B. Clegg Jr., Jeremoja Abebe, they moved to Atlanta, Georgia in 1990. After joining the Shrine of the Black Madonna, they served the PAOCC with a revolutionary faith, earning them African names Chikuyu and Magoza. In 2013, they were both ordained as elders, serving the church together for over 31 years in the music and Ursha ministries. Throughout their 63 years of marriage, they welcomed eight grandchildren and two great-grandsons. They endured the highs and the lows of life with grace, dignity, and laughter, sharing a mutual love of music. Honoring today, Elders Walter Chikuyu and Helen Magozi Child. Get connected and stay connected online with the Shrine of the Black Madonna Virtual Village. Worship, join, learn, give, connect with us all in one place in just three easy steps. One, go to our landing page via our link tree URL or QR code. Two, browse our selections and decide what you want to do and where you want to go. Three, click on your choice and we'll take you right there. Yes, in just three easy steps, you can worship, join, learn, give, all in one place. So get connected and stay connected with us online at the Shrine of the Black Madonna Virtual Village. Blackie. Welcome. For many children, teens, and young adults of today, if you were to ask them what they think when they hear the words Black Panther, their spontaneous response would 
probably be Wakanda, Vibranium, Queen Ramanda, T'Challa, Shuri, Okoyu, etc. All names and characters of the Black Panther movie. The Black Panther movie, while powerful in its portrayal of Black people displaying their intelligence, leadership, culture, resourcefulness, strength, creativity, genius, and power, is the imagination of a fictionalized time and place. In my opinion, the movie has conflated the reality of the strength and truth of the authentic Black Panther Party. What a contradiction to have the Black Panther movie portray the agent of the CIA as showing any genuine concern and affiliation for T'Challa, the Black Panther, and his people. In reality, the CIA worked hand in hand with the FBI, which was the lead agency in the destruction death and decimation of the Black Panther Party and all other black organizations during the era of the civil rights and black power movements. By way of its counterintelligence program known as COINTELPRO. Now, let's go from the movie to the movement. While the movie portrayed awesome black women characters with royalty, power, intelligence, and beauty, let us talk about today the real life revolutionary women of the Black Panther Party. For this presentation in Women's History Month, we will share reflections of seven, me several memorable women of the Black Panther Party. There were many women who contributed to the growth and development of the Black Panther Party. Women who worked diligently, tirelessly, consistently supporting the various programs that the Black Panther Party originated and operated. But make no mistake, the organizations and institutions of the civil rights and Black power movements were not devoid of the stain, the disease, and the cancer of the patriarchal domination that is prevalent in systems formulated on the biases, prejudices, and beliefs of white men in power. Black women face the three-headed monster, classism, racism, and sexism. Women whose names are not generally known, but whose impact on the lives of young black children will forever be remembered by those children now in their 50s and 60s and appreciated by our communities where they served. These Panther women interacted with many and the work of these women is indelibly etched forever in their lives, manifested in their behaviors and influential in their choices. For the contributions and commitments of these women to the revolution, we say, thank you. We say, asante sana. And to those more publicly known, Elaine Brown, Kathleen Cleaver, Barbara Easley Cox, Erica Huggins, Chaka Khan, Rosemary Mealy, Frederica Newton, Charlotte Hill O'Neill, Afeni Shakur, and Asata Shakur, we acknowledge the record of the work that you have done on behalf of our people. The total story will not be told here today, but we will share just some brief snippets of their involvement in the Black Panther Party. In spite of the resistance she faced as a woman, Elaine Brown was a fearless an effective leader. She served as the chairwoman of the Black Panther Party from 1974 through 1977. And after she left the party, she founded the National Alliance for Radical Prison Reform. 
Kathleen Cleaver was married to Eldridge Cleaver. She was the communications secretary of the Black Panther Party and was the first woman member of the cabinet. After work in the Black Panther Party, she served on the faculty of Emory University School of Law. Barbara Easley Cox was a member from 1970 to 1974. She worked not only in local chapters in Oakland, Philadelphia, and in New York, but also in several countries in Africa. Erica Huggins devoted 14 years to the Black Panther Party. She served eight years as a director of the Oakland Community School. She was the first black person and the first woman appointed to the Alameda County Board of Education. Chaka Khan, known for her performances in the entertainment world, also was a member of the party, and she worked with them to help in serving meals as part of the Black Panther Party Breakfast Program. And I just want to say, that breakfast program served as a model. In New York City, there presently is a breakfast program where the City Board of Education does serve meals to children, and it was modeled on the Black Panther Party program. Rosemary Mealy was outraged at the blatant murder of Fred Hampton and became an active member in the Black Panther Party. And as a member of the Connecticut chapter, she traveled to other locals to build the outreach of the Black Panther Party. She's also the author of the book entitled Fidel and Malcolm X, Memories of a Meeting. Frederica Newton joined as a teenager. She married Huey in 1981, and she later founded the Huey P. Newton Foundation. Charlotte Hill O'Neill was a musician, poet, and artist. She fled the United States and went to Africa and helped to establish the international section of the Black Panther Party in Tanzania. Afeni Shakur, a good friend of Shamari's and mine, was part of the Panther 21 that were charged with planning acts against monuments in New York City. She represented the Panther 21 in court and successfully defended the group. She was the mother of the famed rapper Tupac Shakur and his sister Setua Shakur. Asada Shakur, our revolutionary warrior. Asada is a political activist. She's part of the student takeover at City College in New York, which protested the low numbers of black faculty at City College. She worked in California to increase the outreach of the Black Panther Party. And upon return to New York, she was the leader of the Harlem chapter of the Black Panther Party. True to its mission to disrupt, defame, and destroy activists in the movement, the CIA and the FBI engaged in attempts to silence the voice of, of Asata. She was arrested 10 times in charges of several felony crimes, including bank robberies, attempted murder, and kidnapping. She stood trial, and the results were either a hung jury, dismissal, or acquittal. But the enemy is relentless, and they pursued and had Asata imprisoned. She escaped with the help of others in our community and is now living in Cuba. Now we're going to move forward and talk about the fact that these sisters were dedicated to fighting for the Black Panther Party's 10-point program. 10 points that were the guiding principles for what the Panther Party wanted to do. Number one, simple, we want freedom. In case you didn't know it, we're not yet free. We want freedom, we want the power to determine the destiny of our black community. Number two, we want full employment for our people. We need to have our people employed so that they can be gainfully gaining the income to be able to get the resources that they need. 
Number three, we want an end to the robbery by the capitalists in our community. Our community serves as a colony for capitalists. They come in, they take our work, they take our resources, they suck us dry, they take that money, they don't recirculate it in our community, and they take it elsewhere. Number four, we want decent housing fit for the shelter of human beings. It's abominable what some cities are offering as saying their shelter for the people, the conditions are hard, they're not anything healthy, and we want housing fit for human beings. Number five, and this is so pertinent for today, we want education for our people that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society. We want the full story to be told. We don't want pieces of it. We don't want it to be hidden, the full story. And you know, today there are many states that are attempting to hide that story. Many states that don't want you to be woke. They want you to go back to sleep like Rip Van Winkle. But we say we've got to tell the whole story, the true story. Number six, we want all black men to be exempt from military service. There was a mistaken belief that if you went into the military and fought for this country, when you came back, you would have all kinds of entitlements, not for black men, just the opposite. They were redlined and not allowed to get any of the services in housing or education that others got. And that was at the insistence of the government with the plans that they put in place. Number seven, we want an immediate end to police brutality and the murder of black people. Yes, the murder of black people. The list is endless. There are those that we may know of, but then there are many that never break past the headlines, never have their story told that are in fact murdered by those who are paid to protect us. Number eight, we want freedom for all black men held in federal, state, county, and city prisons and city jails. This is a system of injustice that has continually held black men without their rights. They've had all kinds of trumped up charges. And we're beginning to see that as this Innocence Project is gathering more steam and support, that the numbers of black men who have been held falsely is increasing. But we're able to now move to have them released. Number nine, we want all black people, when brought to trial, to be tried in court by a jury of their peer group or people from their black communities. There's no understanding, there's no communication, there's no grounds for uh, understanding what the issues are of people who don't look like us, who don't know our history, don't know our story, and oftentimes don't care. And lastly, number 10, we want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. So all of these are reasonable demands for anyone that is living in a country, particularly that calls itself the land of the free and the home of the brave. And we want those justices to be brought for our people. That was the 10 point program. And as we look at the women of the Black Panther Party and the work that they did for the party itself, which benefited all of us in our communities where we live, I invite you to refer to their examples as you look at your lives and design some strategies for yourself that can also be beneficial for our people. Romans 16, one through four says, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church of at Centura, where you may receive her in the Lord in a matter worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of from you. For indeed, she has been a helper to many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risk their own necks for my life. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles 
are grateful to them. So now we're looking at some biblical reference that talks about women acknowledging the contributions that they made, acknowledging that they are co-workers and that they are deserving of all of the support that can be given to them. But as we look at these women and as we look at the women of the Black Panther Party, first of all, we notice that these people were a part of a group. They weren't individuals. They weren't doing their individualistic goals. They took their individual skills and talents and contributed them in a sacrificial manner for the expansion of the group and to help achieve their goals. This collectivism expands the synergy and magnifies the power that comes from group strength. Jeremoji Abebe Ajiman speaks to this phenomenon in his book, Black Christian Nationalism. What I would like to invite you to do as you come to look at these examples of people and how you can apply their principles to your life and bring that to a group is I'm bringing you four R's. Reassess, recalculate, reaffirm, and relaunch. Reassess, recalculate, reaffirm, and relaunch. Looking at each of them just briefly, reassess. What are your needs? What, are you, what is your status? Where are you in terms of your original out plan, your original plans when you started out? Where are you? It's called a needs assessment. If you ever have to write a proposal, you have to give them a status, an update, a report on where you are, what the issue is, what the problems are, where you are in that uh, plan, and what you plan to do about it. So that's the first one, reassess. The second one is recalculate. You know, sometimes I'm driving along and listening to uh, my navigation system and I miss a turn and it says recalculating because you can always get to where you want to go. You can always get to where you want to go. It may not be the original plan that you laid out, but if you make adjustments or make a U-turn or make a right turn or go back and return around and come again, you can still get to where you want to go. So these recalculations are adjustments that need to be made to a present situation or location so that you can achieve your objective. The third one is reaffirm. Reaffirm, go back in your mind, think about it. What are your purposes, your goals, and your objectives? What is it that you say you want to do? And reaffirm that by speaking those words because words have power. We're talking about the power of self-talk. We're talking about speaking life, health, love, and success to yourself. You are who you are because of what you believe about yourself. And some stages, it may not be because of what you believe, but because of the prayers of others and their encouragement who see in you some unexpressed potential that can be beneficial to our group. It may not always be that you're going to be able to keep a steady pace, but you've got to make sure that you reaffirm that the messages and the words that you send to yourself have power. If you hear the same message over and over and it's a negative one, that plays into what it is that you're going to manifest by your actions. And the other part of reaffirming what it is that you want to do and be is to define your beliefs. By your beliefs, the Bible says you are saved. If you believe that you're capable, if you believe that you have the ability, if you believe that that option is there for you, that's gonna motivate you and propel you to move forward in what it is that you want to achieve. There's a popular term nowadays, it's called mindfulness. But for me, it's just an update of what the old folks used to say. They used to say, you better mind, you better mind. And it also reminds me of the term that our elders used to say, make like, make like, make it as seem as if you already have what you're getting, what you're seeking to get. 
And then the other expression, fake it till you make it. Present yourself in a certain way. Have a certain mindset. Affiliate yourself with those people who are in those kinds of positions or making those statements that you are working to achieve. When my mother would receive information about some occurrence or some events, I would hear her say, ask a question, and you believed it? It wasn't that you shouldn't have believed it. It wasn't that you should have believed it. It was, how did you process that information? Did you believe it? What do you believe? And that abundance of information and technology that we have today, it's relatively easy to access primary sources to be able, we used to have to go to, if you, had a, if you were fortunate enough to have a set of encyclopedias, you had to go look it up and try to get the information. If you had to go to the library, you depended on the librarian. And I'm sure some of us who are my age remember the card catalog. You had to go through those cards and get the card catalog. Now pick up your phone, Siri, and pose your question to her. So in the palm of your hand, you're able to get the answers to the research that you want to have. So we're do don't accept blindly and repeat idly those sound bites that popularize the six o'clock news, the seven o'clock news, and don't embrace idle gossip. This white dominant society has since its inception ingrained in our children and shouted its belief that blacks are inferior. The message is entrenched in the school system, it's projected by the media, and it's institutionalized in all of our organizations. Sadly, some blacks, not having learned the truth, embrace that concept. But scientific, historical research easily destroys that falsehood. So I'm encouraging you to open your mind and change your thinking. Romans 12 and 2 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And when we think about the mind, it's the executive functioning. It's the ability to think and analyze and be able to make decisions based on that. My husband Shamari and I often reflect on the power that we have in our hands in the form of our cell phones. It's immediate, it's quick, it's convenient, and it is powerful. So this is the message that I want to leave with you. The fourth point being relaunch. When you make a decision, make an announcement. Let people know. Make it known to others that this is what you are beginning to do. Make sure also that you share it with somebody who is like-minded. Because there are people out there who are out to attack you. So as you make it known and as you relaunch, be mindful. Not everybody is going to embrace your idea and not everybody is going to say, oh, that's a good idea. Not everybody is going to say, let me join you. But relaunch it. It's important that you make it known so that you have to man up or as we're saying in Women's History Month, woman up to make it known and be held accountable. These are some important points and we wanna encourage you to be able to do that. It's important, we wanna relaunch, we wanna make it powerful, we want to make sure that we are supported by our group venture and we're looking forward to reaching back to all of the work that was done by our predecessors, by our ancestors, the Sankofa talks about reaching back and going back and bringing from the past that which can be applied to the future. Remembering that, remembering that our people are powerful, that they are mighty, and that their DNA is in us and that we have the ability to do the same thing. Thank you so much. Be powerful black women, and that's what you are. Shine bright, shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus.
Jesus.